all of our worship team and Matt for sharing your violin again today. That was great. We always love that. So um, let's see. So today we're, uh, we're finishing up sort of our following of questions. Um, all of these questions we've found so far in the Gospels, but this one is from a Gospel author, John. It's in Revelation. So we've been going through these questions that have been asked of Jesus or by Jesus. And the first one we looked at was, who do you say that I am? Jesus asked this of his disciples. Who do you say that I am? Do you say that I'm a prophet? Do you say that I'm Elijah? Do you say that I'm John the Baptist? And Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the anointed one. And so Jesus blesses him saying, you've, you've called me. You've called me correctly, right? That's who I am. I'm the son of God. Then we looked at the question, uh, what is truth? And this was asked by Pilate. Jesus says that everybody's on the side of truth will follow me. And Pilate flippantly asks him and dismisses him saying, well, what is truth? And we talked about that Jesus is the truth in person. He claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, that there's no other way to the Father except through him. And then we looked on our Easter message, a question asked by Jesus to Mary. He says, woman, why are you weeping? Who is it you're seeking? And then he says her name, Mary, and she recognizes him. And so she was crying, thinking that she had lost her teacher, but it turns out her teacher had conquered the grave and was there back, represented it in the flesh, remembering her and, and still achieving his work, that he was still on the throne, that he had actually conquered death and that he was not done there. He was going to ascend to the throne and be there with his father. That was sort of the crowning jewel of the resurrection that we didn't cover is that he didn't just resurrect, he returned to his father and yet lives. Um, and so today I'm, uh, I'm going to have us look forward to Revelation 5 where the expectations and hopes of these questions, um, uh, they find their culmination uh, in Revelation. And Revelation, of course, is one of the more difficult books. Uh, I looked at our sign right after Easter, and I saw the title, and I was like, why did that get up there? Oh, yeah, I chose that. Why did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> Who is worthy to open the scroll is the question for today. Um, and I would let you all know that I am a student of Revelation. I am not an expert. And so my goal today is to make you better students of this book along with me, tell you about some of the ways I try to study it and try to tell you the things that even students can be certain on. And um, I think if you wanted to look at any of the chapters of the New Testament and trying to find the ones that ha cause the most division between godly people, you'd look at Revelation 20, you'd look at Matthew 24, maybe a couple others. But those ones are some of the big ones, especially when it comes to how do we interpret scripture? Is it looking forward to something? Is it looking back at something that happened recently after the, the passing of Jesus? Um, and so I guess let's start with, uh, with this. Have you guys ever heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect? This is a, uh, well, J Julie actually knows, so now I'm nervous, but let's see if I get it right. <laughs> this is something that when you start something, your confidence level is pretty high. So you start gardening and you think, oh man, I'm pretty good at this. And then you realize the more you learn, your confidence dips because you realize there's just so much to this and I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. You know, when you first started, you took the plastic plant with the solar thing and you put it by the sun and the flower goes like this. Eventually you realize that's, that's not even a plant. <laughs> you actually have to plant the seeds, but no, you're probably just buying the house plants and killing them for years before you start gardening, right? Um, your confidence as you learn something actually generally decreases when you learn that there's so much to it. And over time, as you master the subject, you'll see your, in your, your, your levels increase. Well, I'm sort of at the bottom of the curve here. I've been reading books on Revelation. I read a whole book just on chapter 20 on the three views of the millennium. And and that, that brought up more questions. And now there's a book in our church library I could point out to one of you if you're interested that's on the four interpretations of the entire book of Revelation. So it's a side-by-side -side commentary on different views that you can take. And so there's technically four views that you'll see um, taken of Revelation. The first is a historicist view, like a historical view that this is, it basically says that Revelation looks forward to uh, a prophecy of scripture that is is calling forward and predicting the arc of church history throughout time. Um, and this was held by uh, the greats such as Martin Luther, um, Spurgeon, Whitfield, all of these men saw a lot of scripture actually bashing the Pope. Um, it got a lot of popularity and it really galvanized the Protestant movement. And 
pragmatically speaking, that's great, but nobody holds those views these days. These greats of, of histor history, nobody agrees with their interpretation of Revelation on, on the, s the smaller points. Um, the other is a preterist view. This is saying that these are events that were future to the John and his contemporary audience, but were satisfied in the fall of Jerusalem and, um, and how there was the, the destruction of the second temple. And so a lot of these people see this as um, no different than some Old Testament revelation that we see as already accomplished. We'd read those and be edified by how those were accomplished um, in days that weren't ours. Uh, and, and still, yet there's still parts of the book that looks forward to what Christ is yet accomplishing. The next is the futurist view and probably the one that's the most popular in our day. Um, popularized largely by um, most, uh, most of our, I don't know, pop published authors that get popular sort of hold this view, and, and you've got um, the Left Behind series that holds this view, that everything in this is actually going to um, predict something that's yet to come. This is the one that catches a lot of attention, and, and you'll start reading the newspapers and trying to understand how does that fit into this. And then the final view is, is sort of the spiritual view, the allegorical view, the one that says, well, these are sort of timeless truths, and we shouldn't expect specific fulfillment. So you shouldn't expect to see this thing happen or that thing happen. This is just a, a tendency of how God works through history and will continue to work through our times. Um, and so you'll see a couple of those things pop up here. But the most important thing about the book of Revelation and where we find total agreement among Christians is its high view of Jesus Christ. All four views have a high view of Jesus Christ. He is the Savior and Lord. He is the satisfaction of Old Testament covenants and New Testament hopes and expectations. And all four views know that Jesus is coming again that he's coming soon, that there's going to be a bodily resurrection, and that there will be peace on earth when all is said and done. And so some people wonder, well, am I a pre-millennial or amillennial? And then I think, you know, there's a version that if you're not sure, you should just be a pan-millennial. It's all going to pan out in the end. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't come up with that. I can't take credit for it, but it's pretty good. So if you're confused by the book of Revelation, I want you to realize it's our tendency to make everything of this or nothing of this book. And there's a couple of things in here. We'll look at the disagreements, but then there's things that we're certain on. And that's who Christ is and what he's doing. So let's look at Revelation 5. By Revelation 4, uh, the book takes a turn from letters to specific churches in Asia that has specific timely advice for them that, of course, can be applied to our days. But then you see the scene of heaven enter in chapter 4 um, that these angels and, and there's this beautiful city and, and things that are our vocabulary is stretched to to express and things that our brains are stretched to understand like why do angels look so crazy um we're going to go to chapter five where this question is asked who is worthy to open the scroll for some reason uh the nasb which i have in front of me says book it we're going to go with scroll here um so it says in verse one I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? And no one in heaven on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book uh, or to look into it. So this scroll is going to be our first point of disagreement. These different views would say, some people see the scroll as just the future events, just God's revelation of the future, what, like whatever that's going to be, this is what that is. Some would say this was the coming judgment for Jerusalem. Some would say that this is the first judgment of seven judgments that comes in chapter 6. Um, th this is talking about the judgments and the terrors that were are going to come and befall uh, earth, something that we still look forward to. And, and so what is the scroll? All I can say as a student is that this is something that is God's revelation and that it's good. Um, we see that it's good because in verse 4, he says, Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look into it. So it's something to look forward to, but one of those views is that there's coming judgment. Judgment in the eyes of a Christian that's thought through this a little bit is a good thing because there's things that have happened to you there's things that have happened in history that have gone unavenged. And there's times where the, 
the, the Bible literally lays out and it says, do not go and seek revenge, right? It says, I am the Lord, I am the avenger, I will repay, right? Leave room for the Lord's wrath. So don't go and avenge yourself, leave room for the Lord's wrath. He's going to make right. Um, and so judgment is good because God is totally, totally good. He's, he has a perfect understanding of what is right and wrong, and he holds to those standards perfectly. So when God executes judgment, there's, there's victims that have not been avenged. There's people that have not been, that have not found justice in the legal system on earth or, or in, in maybe better things happen to them and their, their life sort of takes a turn for the better if they persevere through situations. Sometimes there's suffering that leads to more suffering. And whether that's you or people groups or periods of history, God is not letting those things go unpunished. Perhaps it is the future, and perhaps the future is bright. Uh, bright. There's a, a view called postmillennialism that thinks that when Christ is going to come after a period of of long uh, Christian dominance in the culture, and it's not a view I particularly hold, but it's a pretty optimistic one, right? Um, and so, either way, whatever we're looking at, we're seeing that this scroll is God's revelation, and that it's good. This this author, John, he says that I began to weep greatly and found no one worthy to open the book or to open the scroll and look into it. And so it's not that nobody's strong enough. You could reach up and break that seal, but that seal, you're not worthy to open it. You're not good enough to open it. If it is judgment, you're not good enough to read God's judgments. If it is the future, you're not good enough to execute God's future. If it is the, the dominance of the Christian government, then you're not good enough to pull it off without him. Verse 5 says, And the elder said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the, the root of David, has overcome and opened the book and its seven seals. So don't be sad. Whatever God is doing, he is worthy to execute his plans. And so when we look at different opinions of Revelation, I'd encourage you when you hear somebody tell you about how today's events line up with what's going on in Revelation and they cause fear. And when humans see fear and humans see patterns, they try to connect the dots. This elder is saying, stop weeping. God is in control of these events and he's going to take care of it and he's worthy to do this good thing we're looking forward to. He's worthy. He's in control. I think a lot of times I get frustrated by interpreters that try to look at the book of Revelation and see they, they fail to put God in control. They fail to say that it's God's purposes that are being accomplished. And, um, and that, that becomes very frustrating to me because if you want to imbue some false teaching, you either take things to the Greek, where I'm not a Greek person I, and I, I'm not a Greek scholar, so I can't verify what you're saying, or you take things to symbols in the Revel book of Revelation that, and, you, and you try and help people see patterns. When we want to be students of the Bible, first go to the Bible and read it clearly, then go and test your interpretive methods, your commentaries, and things like that. Go to the Bible first and see if there's cause for all these, th these, these, this fear, right? This is saying that stop weeping. The lion of uh, from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome as to open the, the seals. He's, he's ready to open the seals. So it's emphasizing that the lion of Judah, this is a, a strong imagery. And yet we see in this next passage He's, he looks for the lion, and, and in verse 6 he says, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb. And so this lion, this mighty, strong, worthy person was the lamb, the lamb of God. And so I think it's important to notice throughout the entire book of Revelation that Jesus is kicking butt. He's not meek, right? Th he's, he's the lion, and yet we see a lamb. We see the lamb. The lamb is referenced 28 times, I believe, in the book of Revelation. The lamb is consistently how we're characterizing Christ, and he's yet a conquering king. He's got uh, a sword, and guess what's on the sword? Well, it's the blood of his enemies. He's conquering, and yet he's conquering as the man who came and died to accomplish peace for us. And so we see strength even in Jesus, in his moment of weakness, we see the greatest strength, the greatest sense of worth, the greatest person worthy of honor and glory we'll see in this chapter. He's the lion, and we see him as a lamb. It's like, 
look, behold, there's a lion. And surprise, he's, it's the lamb. It's him. It's the guy from the root of David. It's the guy from Judah, the one that walked this earth, the one that was seen by the contemporary audience uh, uh, of, this, of this book that they saw the resurrected Christ. So he says, I saw between the throne and the four living creatures the, uh, and the elders a, s- uh, a lamb standing as if slain, as if slain. So he had the wounds like we talked about on Easter that he had the continuity of his body. He still had the scars that Jesus, when he resurrected, he canceled your sin debt. He didn't cancel your history or who you were or what it took to win you back. He kept those scars. And so this lion, this capable lion, well, he looks like a little lamb and he's been sl- he looks as if he's been slain. And yet there's this pivot into this dramatic imagery here. And it says, and he has seven horns and seven eyes, and se- uh, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And so he goes from something familiar to something extreme and dramatic and foreign to us. So this horns and these eyes and, and the spirits, this is again where you'll see godly men throughout history disagreeing with each other. In general, you'll see that this this seven spirits, almost all interpreters take this as this is telling us something about who he is rather than what he looks like. You might disagree with that, and that's okay. We all believe on who Christ is, the slain and risen lamb, right? Um, some people would see this as the seven spirit, the, the seven horns as he's all powerful, the seven eyes as he's all seeing, um, and he has the seven spirits of God to say that he's all wise and all knowing. Some people wonder if the spirits, these are, if these remind us of the angels in previous chapters, or perhaps this is the Holy Spirit, and I think the problem with that is that the spirits is actually plural. We don't have plurality when we talk about the Holy Spirit, but some godly people still saw it as that for a long time throughout history, and some do today. Um, Anyways, we see that this slain lamb, he's actually powerful, wise, and all-knowing, right? And that he's, he's something familiar and yet foreign. I once talked to an Orthodox priest. He was performing on his grandpa's funeral, and he was trying to encourage me to consider orthodoxy. And the one thing that I, that stood out to me that I thought was, pretty cool, but you don't have to be orthodox to follow this. He says, we revel in the paradoxes of scripture, that Jesus is knowing yet unknowable, that he is personal yet distant, that he is um, present yet everywhere, right? There's there's things in scripture that we understand that to really get a whole grasp on God, we're going to start talking in contradictions, that, that he can, it, it, the contradictions that are yet true, like sort of like an oxymoron, right? And so Jesus here is the lamb. He's slain. He's small, yet he's mighty, yet he's distant. Yes, he's something that I wouldn't recognize as, as a lamb. Um, in verse 7, it says, He came and he looked and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So we're, we're, he's taking the, th- the, the scroll. He's going up to the throne and he's approaching it with authority. He's taking it out of the right, the strongest, the most capable hand um, for exacting, you know, the duty of the throne and he's he's taking it and taking that scroll something only somebody worthy would do everybody else would fall on their face before the throne in verse 8 he said when he had taken the book the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb each one holding a sharp uh, a harp with golden bowls full of incense and they were their prayers of the saints so you've got two sets of characters here again that are strange to us are the the four living creatures You've got one that's a lion, the, the chief of beasts, one that's uh, um, a calf, the chief of domesticated beasts, one that's uh, an eagle, the chief of the flying beasts, and one that's uh, a, a man, the, the chief of the you know, intellectual created beings, right? Um, perhaps those are the things that are holding up God's throne in Ezekiel that are showing the, the security of his government. Uh, perhaps they're just freaky angels. I don't know. Um, the 24 elders... Are these rulers of the church? Are they um, the 24 people from Adam to think it's Perez in Genesis 12? There's a lot of opinions on this, right? But what we do know, what's not up for debate, is that all of these powerful, mighty, heavenly beings, uh, they fell down before the Lamb. Each one of them holding a harp, 
So they're in a posture of worship and they're holding up bowls of incense. There's some kind of a ceremony. I think the really cool thing here is that the incense is, is the prayers of God's people. Your prayers are pleasing to God. They're an aroma that makes the atmosphere of heaven holy, that, that gives uh, an air of, of majesty to the Lamb. You are part of the worship experience in heaven when you pray. You are giving to God what is due, the glory and the honor and, and the beauty that we can actually express to God in our, in our lives today. And so these elders, they're holding bowls full of the prayers of the saints. God values your prayers. That's something very clear that we can get from this. And they worship him and they give him honor. They are a part of this heavenly procession, this heavenly ceremony of worshiping God. And they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom of priests to, your, to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So they're singing a new song. There was a song that was sang in chapter 4, Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And so some people would say that this is showing the difference between the covenants, that the the old song in chapter 4 is worshiping God for who he was. And this new one is talking about, well, it's the satisfaction of the new covenant. The satisfaction of the new covenant, what does it look like? Well, the lamb, he's worthy because of what he's accomplished on the cross. He's slain. And he's purchased for God through his blood men from every nation. That's where we saw in, in Tom's verse this morning in, in the, the Abrahamic covenant that Abraham was going to be blessed and be created into a great nation that would become uh, Israel and that through Israel all nations would be blessed. We had a Messiah come through Israel, a Messianic, uh, uh, a Messiah, sorry, a Jewish Messiah that came and engrafted us G- Gentiles into the, the tree of the people of God that we are engrafted branches and that's pretty amazing right that whenever we see the word nations I, I'm sure it's been pointed out to you before that we're talking about the word ethnicities that in uh, in the Greek it's talking about ethnos or ethne I don't know the exact uh, phrase of it but we're talking about people groups so does God care about me and my people and my culture yes he certainly does Does he want to be worshipped by every tongue? Yes, he certainly does. Does God want to make us all uniform? No, probably not, right? He doesn't want us to be all uniform. There's a distinction between these nations and their tongues and their peoples and and where they come from. Yet, you don't have to be uniform to all be unified in who you're worshipping. All these ununiform peoples and cultures and expressions of Christian worship are going to be unified under the worship of God. That's a beautiful thing for our culture that's so sensitive and concerned about racial justice. The gospel has for its consequence, not for its initial purpose, the unification of peoples. How can you hate somebody for whom Christ died? How can you hate a nation that Jesus purchased with his blood? Um, it's not possible, right? If you're a sinner, how's it possible for you to hold some kind of superior judgment over another sinner from another culture? Jesus bought all peoples back to himself through the promises he gave to Israel and satisfied for all of us. It's really amazing. I think that's something that we can see in Revelation throughout its whole narrative is God is redeeming and buying back all peoples to himself. And it's because of what he did he purchased them with his blood. And verse 10, I think, is very interesting. It says, You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. So this verse is calling back to um, verses like you'd find in Ezekiel that describes Israel, right? That they were a kingdom of, uh, of priests, that they were a people to, to rule and carry God's authority and rule on earth. And the church, I'd say, is, is the satisfaction of this. I'd say that you see this image in three other places in Revelation where believers, right after we're talking about all nations, we can't simply be talking about Israel anymore, right? That believers are a, a nation of priests and kings. 
and we're reigning upon the earth. And so that's really amazing, right? That we haven't just been sort of forgiven and made free. We haven't just, we're not just slaves given liberty. If we were just slaves given liberty, we'd be rejoicing and for good reason. But we're slaves given the sovereignty and rule, the co heirship, I guess, the being co-heirs with God. That's a huge deal. It's a total 180. It's not just freedom and liberty. We have freedom and liberty and this special place in God's kingdom that we're mediators between God and man. The priests of the day were mediators between God and man, and now that's our role as believers, that we mediate between God and our peers, be- between the people that don't know who he is. We are the access that they can have through him and we're trying to give them direct access by giving them uh, the knowledge of God and hopefully they have the Holy Spirit and and that they can go directly to him as well. And so this, if we miss details like this because we get confused or discouraged by some of the more difficult verses, um, we're missing a lot. This is, this is something beautiful that we can live out today, even if we're saying that maybe verse 10 isn't truly satisfied until the millennial kingdom. I personally have the view that this is true today and that this is going to be completely true when Jesus comes back, but I like to live like this is the kingdom of God today and I get to you know, be a mediator for my peers and my friends and that when I do God's will, I'm helping him reign. I'm helping extend his reign through the earth. Let's go to uh, verse 11. So now we talk about how God sort of gets the worship for what he accomplished through the cross and at Easter. He says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them, uh, the myriads and the myriads, and the thousands of thousands. One commentary, I don't know if it was quoting an older version, said the myriads and myriads of chiliads and chiliads. That's just a funny rhyme. I don't know what that means. Mine says myriads and myriads of thousands and thousands. Um, some of yours might do like a multiplication equation, and it's ten thousands and thousands of ten thousands. The idea is we're getting an innumerable amount of angels here. That Even though there's some fallen angels, the number that is left is innumerable. There's tons of them, right? And they're all singing, worthy is the lamb who was slain. So what is he worthy for? He's worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessings. This is what Jesus deserves after what he achieved for us at Easter. This is what he deserves because he yet reigns and he yet lives and he's achieved it for us so that we can be living stones built into the house of God, right, that he can dwell in. That's amazing. And so all Tens of thousands, millions of angels are singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Let's live like Christ died and really lives. Let's worship him with all we've got. Let's worship him with our very beings. Let's give him the power and the riches and the wisdom and the might and the honor and the glory and the blessings that he deserves from us. 13, it says, And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all the things in them, I heard sing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessings and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. The result, the thing that is most clear is that Christ is yet king. He deserves our worship. And we're looking forward to a day where that worship will be uninhibited. Uninhibited by our mortal bodies, uninhibited by our disagreements over certain things, uninhibited by our misunderstandings of peoples of different cultures or different languages uh, or different traditions. We are all going to step up and say, he's so worthy and we'll hit our knees and worship. So whatever God is accomplishing in our times, Whenever we go to Revelation and we're confused or perhaps we go to an internet forum or some video that gets us freaked out and we forget the point of this story is that we're on the winning side. We're on the side where Christ is in control, where his people are called back to him. He has victory. There is no separation between God and man, even though he can be cast in images that is honestly terrifying and glorious all at once. 
Uh, there's another heavenly paradox, terrifying and glorious, something that I want to draw near to, but I need to hit the ground because I'm fearful of. Christ is in control of our days, um, and Christ is accomplishing his purposes, and there's never something in our history that he's going to be surprised by. He's not surprised that we had COVID. He's not surprised that there's war in Europe. There's, there's nothing that's going to be coming that, that needs to be revealed that, you, that if you don't get it, he's not going to be able to accomplish his purpose, right? We're t- constantly told to be prepared. Be prepared for the coming of the Lord. And I, I, I've made this point maybe about a year ago, and I'll make it again. When we talk about being prepared, if you're secure in Christ, there's nothing you need to do. There's no spiritual cleansing. There's nothing you need to do. Jesus has forgiven your sins. You're prepared spiritually for his return. I'd say be prepared. That means be caught at work, right? The virgins and their lamps, the ones that had the, the oil that were ready to welcome back the king, the ones that, that knew that he was coming and that were prepared meant that they were caught at work. They were caught being faithful. They were caught being obedient. And so even as I'm a student of Revelation, and even as things in the news could make me scared or nervous, um, I'm going to be busy being obedient. Whenever Christ decides to come back, that's my task. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to give him as much glory and honor and power and blessings and riches and might and honor and uh, all those things as I can with my body, with my, with my life, with my resources. Um, if that's what I'm looking forward to, why not start today? Uh, so I think this is a shorter message, and maybe it's just because I'm nervous that we're in this book and I need to get out of the deep end, but we're going we're gonna to call it there, um, and we're going to bring our worship team back up. Uh, but thank you guys for listening. I do have that book, if any of you are interested, just uh, around the corner. Um, I've been reading through the whole thing, trying to sort of understand different perspectives, but at the end of the day, chief, the chief interpretive principle should be scripture, right? A lot of times we hear conspiracy theories and they'd say, oh, you know, well, we have, uh, the Holy Spirit has shown me this to me and if you'd pray about it, you'd just see that I'm right. The, the Holy Spirit worked along with men to write scripture, right? There was an, a human author and he, he spoke through them and when we read the Bible, he's doing that same amazing speech act through us as we interpret the Bible. He's written the word, it's revealed, so the knowledge is there and the Holy Spirit helps us understand scripture as it's written. So, be focused on the word. All right, thank you.